I'd like to invite Erica Deneve to read a poem by my colleague, Lynn Unger. This poem's entitled, In the Ruins. A man sits on the rubble, not just in the rubble, but on the pile of what remains. No people in the bombed out houses, no dogs, no birds, just ragged hunks of concrete and loss. And on his perch, he is playing an instrument constructed of what is left, an olive oil can, a broom handle, a bowed stick and strings. It sounds exactly as it is supposed to sound. The instrument cries, but the man sings, because sometimes Loss is deeper than tears, because sometimes grief is resistance, because somewhere down the very long road, music is stronger than bombs. Remembrance Day can be challenging for Unitarians. After all, the day calls us to remember war to remember the sacrifice of those who served in the military at time of war, especially those who died. Now, the expectation is quite clear. The sacrifice of the soldiers, sailors, and air corps is the subject of our remembering. It's even on the government website under the question, what should we remember? We should remember the sacrifice of the dead. In recent decades, it has become acceptable to secondarily remember the service of all veterans serving in the military, whether they've been in combat or not. After all, they are the ones who stand on guard for thee. I won't demean the holiday or the ceremonies by labeling them a glorification of war. They aren't. At their very best, the ceremonies both mark a celebration and a grieving of the sacrifices made by citizens who answered the call of their nation. However we may judge the events looking back through the filter of today's morality, the people living in those times mostly accepted that taking up of arms was the only real solution to oppression, to racism, to megalomania. I think that in our remembering, we also have to accept their rationale and the morality of the people living at that time. We can criticize decisions that were made, perhaps see ways that it could have all been avoided, but we really are in no position to judge well-intentioned choices based on the values of the day. What we can do is remember. We can remember and we can evaluate and we can make new and perhaps different decisions going forward. And I think our nation and our culture has largely done that. We've made different choices exactly because we do take the time to remember the horrors of the Great War and the Second World War and Korea and the tragedies that ensued around them and the enormous destruction and cost of life and material and environment and everything else. Remembering our challenges and our mistakes is the first step towards healing ourselves and the war and the world. We remember the cost of war, we view the film clips and shudder. And like our Jewish friends who marked the Holocaust, we commit as much as we reasonably can to this happening never again. I frequently attend Remembrance Day services and find them touching and moving. I seldom get through one without some degree of tears. And I have a family history where my ancestors mostly worked in reserved industries like machine shops and were not allowed to join the military service. No one in my clan has ever been in uniform. But I can place myself in the circumstance of the family members who watched sons and fathers and brothers and husbands going off to war and wives and daughters and all of those. I can imagine at times as I wander ancient battlefields what it must have been like, how horrible it must have been. I am so very, very glad that I have never had the chance 
to find out what it would be like firsthand. To be completely clear, I have enormous respect for this annual event, and I would not restrict it or change it. I think it's of great value. In fact, I would suggest expanding it somewhat. In World War II, there were nearly 24 million military deaths in all, among all nations. And that's, that's a staggering number and a staggering tragedy. But it pales in comparison to the 35 to 40 million civilians who also died in that conflict, who died from military action, from exterminations, from starvation, from disease, from other causes. 58% of the deaths of World War II were non-combatant civilians. It is interesting that this staggering number is seldom, if ever, acknowledged on November 11th. Perhaps if we are to begin healing the world, we will remember them needs to apply to all the war dead, not just the ones in uniform. Perhaps the combined number of 60 to 80 million dead should encourage us in our peacemaking efforts. But then, as Joseph Stalin once noted, the death of one man is a tragedy. The death of a million is a statistic. Remembrance Day can be challenging for Unitarians. Our faith promotes the inherent worth of all beings. We allude to and enshrine much of the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights in our principles with phrases like peace, liberty, and justice for all and the concept of inherent worth and dignity. You can look up the Declaration and see how familiar many of the words are. We borrowed liberally. In our services, we sing songs like going to lay down my sword and shield and peace like a river. We want peace. We come together advocating for peace whenever we can. We take to the streets. We write letters in search of peace. And yet as thinking citizens of the planet, we have to acknowledge that war exists and that sometimes we are drawn into them for reasons good and bad. Even this congregation has some history of conflict regarding war. According to the first minister in this congregation, Charles Francis Potter, immediately following the declaration of hostilities in World War I, Edmonton had the highest rate of military volunteerism of any city in the world. Edmontonian men flocked to the service and the women flocked to the nursing services and so on and so forth. By 1916, however, the battles were finally being joined by Canadians and casualty reports started coming back to the home front. And Potter noticed that the women wearing black started entering the congregation. And a year later at the Battle of Passchendaele, a fight that ended 100 years ago yesterday, a fight that uh, the Loyal Eddies sustained 76% casualties on a single day, including the Olympian police officer and First Nations person Alex Dakota. How does one heal the world in the time of war? In his book, Unitarians in Canada, Reverend Philip Hewitt recounts that Potter had an idea. Potter wrote, of the whole period, starting with the mass enlistment, my congregation, which had been steadily growing, was reduced to virtually a few women. And very soon these women came in black with sad-faced little children. The young women and the unchurched ones, too, who in every city seemed to gravitate towards the Unitarian minister for weddings and funerals, were not to be satisfied by the old platitudes. Hewitt noted that Potter discovered that the most effective form of ministry in such situations was to form a community of suffering. Potter wrote, When I found one woman overcome with grief, I sent the next bereaved woman to her. And then when she too had found peace, I made her go and console another sufferer. Soon we had quite a group of women who sought and found much comfort together and they were a help to me also, for their friendship was a beautiful thing to see. And to be near them was a benediction. There seems to be a peculiar quality of rare sweetness developed when human beings who have shared in any tragic experience 
join in an association of mutual helpfulness. So perhaps to remembrance, we can add sharing and community building, reaching out across class and race and age to try and find common connections. It strengthens us at home, but it makes it harder to hate somebody far away, too. These ties can bring comfort, and they can bring resolve. There is strength in numbers, and finding like-minded people who know exactly what you suffer is a joy. The old saying, a trouble shared is a trouble halved, has truth to it. From those connections springs first a healing of the self, and maybe, just maybe, the beginning of healing the world. The Great War was a challenging time for many Canadian Unitarian ministers and congregations, for the country, at least publicly, was dominated by a powerful pro-war jingoism. Young men not in uniform were often shamed. The city of Berlin in Ontario was renamed Kitchener after the Secretary of War for Britain, and Prussia in Saskatchewan was renamed Leader. Pre-war pacifism and anti-militarism had become difficult to sustain in face of public pressure. Yet here in Edmonton, Charles Potter, himself a pacifist, held fast. And thence came the conflict with our leading layperson and congregation founder, W.H. Alexander. Alexander became furious with Potter. He wrote, Mr. Potter has taken no account of our national feelings or our national feasts. We have no prayers for the king, none for the brave soldiers and sailors. We've never had a word on behalf of England's stand for liberty and justice, but we have heard her government denounced for their treatment of conscientious objectors. In a lesson that all Unitarian Universalist ministers know, when a huge kerfuffle breaks out within a congregation, there is only one ending, the departure of the minister. And Charles Francis Potter left in 1916. And I'm sure the women in black were terribly sad to see him go. But here is a more helpful thought. Maybe, maybe there has been healing since then. If we take World War I and II, if we take World War II as kind of part two of World War I, and many historians suggest that it is, and if we put brackets around that whole 40 years from, say, 1914 to 1950, 45 years, since then, the world has endured and enjoyed its longest sustained period of relative peace. Now, we hear of war and fighting all over the globe, skirmishes, partly because we have such good media these days and, and that sort of thing. And I don't want to dismiss or demean the suffering that goes on in those smaller wars, but I think we can pull back and look from a slightly different lens. We do live in the most peaceful time in human history, relatively. Canada's most recent involvement of note was, of course, Afghanistan. We did not lose 60,000 soldiers to Afghanistan. In fact, you might be surprised to note that in Afghanistan and Pakistan, there were but 149,000 war deaths in 15 years of conflict. Tragic still, but a far cry from even the 400,000 deaths worldwide during the Vietnam era, or the 30,000 deaths on the first day of the Battle of the Somme in 1915. After the Great War, the League of Nations was founded. It failed because of faulty premise and faulty founding principles and poor structure. But in 1949, the nations of the world came together and tried again and formed the United Nations. And 70 years later, it still is functioning. Lots to criticize about the United Nations, about its relative effectiveness or ineffectiveness, but it is doing some things very, very well. Will it ever live up to its promise? Probably not. It was started by human beings, after all. But we have to give credit to the goodwill and the persistence of those who insist on trying to make it work 
no matter how many wars break out, no matter how many threats there are, no matter how many tin pot dictators arise around the world. Like the clumsy first medicines of long ago physicians, there is much to improve, but as medicine has improved, so is the, the potential for our united gatherings of nations to improve. It is progress. It is not cause for rejoicing, but it is progress. The nature of war has changed. The grand global conflicts seem for now to be behind us. The concept of nuclear war finally seems to have woken us up. Talk to a soldier today and the odds are they will talk more about preserving peace through strength instead of extending power through force of arms. I noticed as we were watching the more traditional commercial that starts off with the World War I scenes, by the time they get to color, the first scene they show is a woman soldier hugging her baby as she goes off to war. And then it shows our soldiers treating children in a medical clinic, distributing food, helping the citizens. There's not a single one of them. They're putting on their packs, but there's not a single one of them shooting or firing or shooting a grenade. There is change happening. And it's really easy to get totally wrapped up in the disaster and the horror and the hatred and, the, oh, my God, I hate war and we've got to have peace and not see that there is daisies coming up through the cracks. There is positive change coming. There are so many sicknesses plaguing our society these days. I could have spoken about uh, all kinds of things like uh, world economic injustice or climate change, but because of the calendar, I chose to put this healing the world message against the backdrop of Remembrance Day. So here are a couple of lessons I draw. Learn from the past, remember the good from history and the bad, and change the choices we no longer think are helpful. Start with healing your own spirits like those women in black and then build connections with others who are suffering as we are. Build alliances, regain strength, speak out, and take action different from that which caused the suffering in the first place. Develop faith and hope. Now, I don't mean we should deny bad things, though either the ones that happen or the ones that might happen. That's probably what gets us into these kinds of messes in the first place. But find ways to throw off the shadows and rebuild the personal and then the collective sense of hope and purpose. Refuse to be trapped by past hurts. Question, stand up, say never again. Expect setbacks, take them in stride. There's simply too much complexity for us to get it right the first time or the tenth time, or maybe even the hundredth time. Celebrate the small progress that is made. We've gone from a time of war to peaceful protests that curtailed the Vietnam War and so far have prevented a nuclear war. Perhaps our efforts have made the making of war more difficult. Understand that today's struggles for truth and reconciliation and for meaningful work on climate change are outgrowths of 65 years of relative peace. We would not be having those discussions if we were in the middle of an all-out war. The things we challenge today only occur because we've managed to stay away from war and have chosen peace instead. So no, we're far from done. The human race will probably never be done with war. And we may not, in the end, succeed. The problems might overwhelm all of us. Yet I believe that every day we are making some small progress in the world. We have no choice but to take small steps to make small progress and do our best to heal the world. Amen.